Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Tracy Nix? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing by this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the alleged crime, then offer my analysis. In 2021, Tracy Nix lived in Wachula, Florida. This is a town in Hardy County with a population of less than 5,000. It's about an hour south of Lakeland, Florida. Tracy had been a high school principal in Hardy County. Tracy had a daughter named Kayla Shock. Kayla and her husband, Drew, had two sons, Asher, who was born in March of 2019, and Ezra, who was born in August of 2020. On December 22, 2021, when Ezra was about 16 months old, Tracy was caring for him at her house. Just a few feet to the west of Tracy's house, there was a large pond stocked with ducks. The only people in the house were Tracy, her husband, and Ezra. Tracy fell asleep on a sofa in the living room, and her husband decided to go to Walmart and run some other errands. Tracy said that when she woke up, she was unable to find Ezra. She looked around and noticed that the garage entrance door was ajar. Tracy went outside and climbed in her vehicle. She drove to the end of her driveway and looked around. The driveway was about 343 feet long. Tracy turned east and drove to a stop sign about 817 feet away. She turned around and drove west for about the same distance past her house. At this point, Tracy called her husband and told him she could not find Ezra. After turning around and driving back toward her house, Tracy saw something white in the pond. She drove in that direction and realized it was Ezra. He was face down in the water. Tracy drove over to the pond and pulled Ezra out of the water. She started CPR, but she did not call 911. At 12.52 p.m., Someone else called 911. First responders arrived at the scene. Ezra was airlifted to a hospital with a faint pulse, but he did not survive. The police believed that Tracy should be prosecuted for Ezra's death, but the Florida Attorney's Office stated, quote, in cases involving the accidental drowning of a toddler, Florida appellate courts have stated that a one-time lapse of judgment would not establish culpable negligence of the caretaker, unquote. On March 5, 2022, about three months after Ezra's death, Kayla had a daughter named Uriel. Now moving to the timeline of the alleged crime. On November 1, 2022, Kayla wanted to visit a hair salon. Therefore, she asked Tracy to babysit her seven-month-old daughter, Uriel. Tracy wanted to go out and have lunch with friends. She took Uriel with her in her 2019 Lexus SUV. After lunch was over, Tracy drove back to her house and parked her Lexus in the garage. She went in the house, but forgot that Uriel was in the back seat of the Lexus. The windows of the vehicle were closed, and the high temperature that day was about 90 degrees. Tracy talked to her dog and played the piano for a long time. Eventually, one of her grandsons came by which led to Tracy remembering that Uriel was in the SUV. She told her husband, who immediately started CPR on the infant, but Uriel did not survive. On November 17, 2022, 16 days after the incident, 65-year-old Tracy Nix was charged with aggravated manslaughter. If convicted, she faces between 12 and 30 years in prison. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one is the drowning death of Ezra Shock. As I mentioned, Ezra drowned in a pond three days before Christmas in 2021. The pond was right behind Tracy's house, but there was a fence between the pond and the house. The police investigated his death and thought there was negligence, but no charges were filed. The investigation revealed that Ezra was able to open an exterior door climb under a fence, and enter the pond. The door handle was 35 inches from the floor, 
but it wasn't a traditional doorknob. Rather, it was a lever-style door handle. These types of handles are often curved. The way the handle was mounted, the curve was at the bottom, which placed the lowest point of the lever at 34 and a half inches from the floor, a half inch lower than where the handle was attached to the door. Ezra's maximum reach from the tips of his fingers to his feet was 36 inches. He had just enough reach to get his finger around the curve in the handle, pull it down, and open the door. There were no child safety locks on any of the doors in the house. The incident report mentions that Tracy was on medication, but some of the report is redacted, therefore important details have been left out. It's not clear if this could have contributed to Tracy sleeping in the day. Both Tracy and her husband were interviewed as part of the investigation. Their stories were a little bit different. Tracy said that she had never seen Ezra open doors in the house and did not know that he could pull down a door handle. She said that they used a doorstop, apparently in the image of a dachshund, like the little dog that has a long body and stubby legs. Tracy indicated that the doorstop was used to keep the cat in the house and not to keep Ezra in the house. The doorstop was not used on the day of the incident. Tracy also mentioned that Ezra loved taking baths, which appears to indicate some type of attraction to the water. Tracy's husband indicated that he placed the metal doorstop, the dachshund, behind the door after he left because he knew Ezra was able to open interior doors. I guess he was thinking that if Ezra could open interior doors, then there was a risk of Ezra opening an exterior door. Tracy's husband did not have the same opinion about Ezra's thoughts on water. He said that Ezra did not like getting a bath. Tracy's husband indicated that, on prior occasions, he had driven Ezra in a utility vehicle to the pond to look at the ducks. They also looked at other animals. Perhaps this explains why Ezra wanted to go to the pond. When looking at all the evidence in the case of Ezra's death, I think the state made the right decision in not pressing charges. A number of unlikely events had to occur in order for Ezra to end up in the pond. Tracy fell asleep. Ezra managed to open an exterior door, which he had never done before. He had only opened interior doors. He was barely tall enough to do it. Ezra made his way under a fence and was found 282 feet from the garage door. Ezra's death was tragic and could have easily been prevented, but I'm not convinced that culpable negligence was involved. I think this was a case where Ezra had developed capabilities faster than Tracy expected. Item number two, after Ezra's death, Kayla would not let her other son, Asher, be alone with Tracy. Kayla said that she didn't trust her mother at all. Clearly, this feeling must have changed because Kayla left her daughter with Tracy 11 months later. This was a poor decision, but I think it speaks to how important caregivers are to parents of young children. Raising children is difficult, and it's convenient to have people available who can watch them from time to time. Everybody needs a break. Furthermore, Ezra's death was tied in with the physical security of the house, and not with any type of memory failure. I would imagine that Tracy and her husband remedied the causes of the first tragedy, like they made the house safe for children. Kayla probably believed that her mother would not make the same mistake twice. Item number three is the death of Uriel Schock. There's not a lot of information available about this incident outside of what I already mentioned. Tracy was watching her granddaughter. She came back from lunch in her SUV, and she forgot that the child was in the vehicle. It was hot outside, the windows in the vehicle were closed, and her granddaughter did not survive. Tracy's attorney suggested that both deaths were accidental. He noted that there have been occasions where people have been struck by lightning two different times. That's the way he looks at this case. He is worried that Tracy will not receive a fair trial. Tracy is totally devastated about what happened. Kayla said that she would like her mother to go to prison. I think it's tempting to look at Tracy's behavior as a pattern. After all, two children under her care died in less than a year. This certainly doesn't look too good for her, but I'm not convinced there is a pattern here. It seems clear that the circumstances surrounding these deaths are completely different. The first death involved a child exiting a house and entering a pond, whereas the second death involved a memory failure and a hot vehicle. People forget children in vehicles all the time, it doesn't necessarily make them murderers. 
I think the problem for Tracy is that people are going to struggle to understand why she wasn't extremely cautious after the first death, not just concerned about door handles and pawns, but concerned about everything. One would think that she would have been hypervigilant. Also, her lapse was not momentary. She talked to her dog and then played the piano for a long time. Why didn't it occur to her that her granddaughter was in the vehicle? Does this point to some larger memory problem of which Tracy was aware? Like, was she irresponsible to care for her granddaughter in the first place because she knew she could not trust herself to remember important information? There are a lot of questions in this case that have yet to be answered. Before we talk about my opinion on the topic of guilt versus innocence in this case, let's take a look at a construct which is critical to a case like this. Item number four is the construct of forgotten baby syndrome. This syndrome can be thought of as a series of three factors that can combine and result in a child being killed in a hot vehicle. Factor one, caregivers often do not understand the dynamics of a hot motor vehicle. A child's body heat rises three to five times faster than an adult's. Children are in danger of dying in temperatures as low as 57 degrees if they are left unattended in a vehicle which is being hit by the sun. In the first 10 minutes of being closed, the temperature inside of a vehicle can rise 20 degrees. A lack of understanding about children and hot vehicles leads to a caregiver being unconcerned about the dangers. Factor two, human memory is flawed by design. Just because an event is important doesn't mean that it cannot be forgotten. A person can forget just about anything. Memory has an autopilot system that takes over for repetitive tasks. The system that would alert a person to a deviation in a pattern has to compete with the autopilot. Sometimes the autopilot wins. This often occurs when routines are interrupted, like if a caregiver normally doesn't take their child to daycare in the morning, but on one particular day, they have to. When information is forgotten, like the fact that a child was left in a vehicle, time will not bring back the memory. The longer it is before the caregiver remembers doesn't make them more responsible. Factor three, leaving a child in a vehicle is not just about losing a memory. It's about creating a memory. The human mind has the capability of creating memories for events that never happened. This is referred to as confabulation, and it's actually quite common. Sometimes when a caregiver goes to work with a child in the vehicle, when they were supposed to drop the child off at a daycare, for instance, the caregiver actually remembers dropping them off. So they think that they dropped them off, even though they went to work with the child still in the vehicle. Their brain has filled in the gaps with what normally would have happened. There have been a few cases where a parent forgot to drop off a child, yet when the parent was at work, they talked with coworkers about their child being in daycare that day. The entire time they were unaware that the child was actually in the back seat of their vehicle. It wasn't a matter of remembering something they forgot. Rather, it was related to a new memory which was created, a memory for an event that never happened. Researchers who study forgotten baby syndrome typically advocate that hot vehicle death cases not be prosecuted. This, of course, doesn't apply if the caregiver was reckless, like if they purposely left a child in a vehicle but then forgot that the child was there. 25% of parents with children under the age of three have forgotten their child in a vehicle on at least one occasion. Now moving back to the case of Tracy Nix and my thoughts on guilt versus innocence. As I mentioned, there's not a lot of information available about this case, but based on what is available, I do not believe that Tracy Nix should be prosecuted. If it comes out later that she knew about some type of memory problem or was recklessly using medication, that could certainly change my opinion. But again, based on what is known right now, I see this as a tragic lapse in memory without a criminal state of mind. The death of Ezra seems to be independent of the death of Uriel. Statistically speaking, the probabilities of these events were independent. Now moving to my final thoughts. When these types of cases happen, the reaction by the criminal justice system is highly varied. Some people never get charged. Others get charged with criminally negligent homicide or manslaughter. Again, Tracy Nix was charged with aggravated manslaughter. 
and a few get charged with murder. All this happens in cases which possess essentially the same circumstances. It's hard to imagine a more inconsistent response to a catastrophe. Criminal prosecution will not repair human recollection. Rather, it will only create another horrible memory to compound the tragedy. Those are my thoughts in the case of Tracy Nix. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.